Hello and welcome to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast, where we talk about life, death and experiences in between. I'm Kirsty Salisbury, the host of the show, and I trust that the conversations within this podcast will offer value, insight and information into what happens in the afterlife. To find out more about the free online community and extra content, be sure to click subscribe and to check out the links in the notes below. And now, let's get into today's episode. I went back to exactly what I had known before I was born. There was something inside of me that woke up something more in a depth that the essence of creation is within us. I, when I went over, it was absolute divine love. It was absolute comforting beauty. I don't know, you could go on details of details, but it, it would boil down to this, it was absolutely wonderful. Welcome back to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast, where we talk about life, death, and experiences in between. Today, I'm joined by Ruth Rousseau Clothier, who has had three near-death experiences. So I'm pretty excited to see what comes out of today's episode. Ruth is also the author of Keys of Internal Wisdom, and she has a learning guide called Wisdom of the Heart, The Book of Life, and Love and Beyond. So they sound like fabulous topics. Ruth, welcome to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. It's fabulous to have you here. It's nice to be here, Christy. Thank thank you. So three near-death experiences. Where do we begin with that? Take us back. Oh, my goodness. It's, um, it, you know, it seems, you know, I'm older, so it, it's been many years of death experiences. Um, I, I had my first one when I was 16 and a half months old. And I had radiation treatment back in 1948. And at that time, radiation was not like it is now. It wasn't very kind to the body, caused many complications in your life after it. I had a um, growth on my spine and it grew a little bit. So they blasted it with radiation. And when it happened, I was only 16 and a half months old. So I, I left my body totally. And, you know, it, it's, they knew something was wrong, but um, I, I, I don't have the details because I didn't understand death experiences until I had my third one. And, um, but all I remember from this is that I went, I went over and I went back to exactly what I had known before I was born. It was so comfortable over there. And I think, I think that's what drew me there was that it, it brought peace and love and and I was just encompassed with energy that I was familiar with that was absolutely beautiful. And then something happened that brought me back to my body and I guess it was them stimulating me or doing whatever they, they did back then. And uh, when I came back, it was such a shock to be there. It was um, painful. Um, this radiation left scar tissue in my lungs, caused heart complications in my life, um, did so many things to me. And, and so all I can say to you is that that death experience to me, I mean, honestly, kept my connection, uh, kept my connection to, to something that was so absolutely beautiful and full of love. And I remember as a child, when anything would ever happen, I would go back to that space that I knew. And I, I, when we write now, I, I think it's the innocence that all of us know when we're coming in. We all, you know, we all know the innocence of our life and what it was, you know, before we came into embodiment. And it was just so beautiful. And I think that it had changed my life forever because I had a lot of ailments. I was in the hospital six times as a child, um, a lot of complications. And, and each time I did, I believed that, I believed that there was something there that would help me, you know, something that could take care of me. And I really, I really honor my parents that they were there for me, you know, that they comforted me and 
I came back in my mother's arms, uh, radiation in those days, you would hold your baby and they would put the radiation on the, on, like on my spine. She held me. So when I came back, I came back to my mother. My mother had a death experience when she was, in, when she was born complete cardiac arrest, never came. And the doctor had pushed her off to the side and um, and said to my, my grandmother, she said, um, the baby is, is not going to live. And my grandmother picked her up and she took care of her and she rubbed her back and she put her near the warm stove and she came, she breathed. And the doctor had given up on my mom. So my mom was kind of a miracle woman and um, so I think that that was the connection when I came back. There was the, the two of us that had experienced death experiences. And and when I came back, I, I felt her compassion. So that was the yeah. first one. That's absolutely amazing. I was blown away when you were talking about how mothers would hold their children while they did the radiation. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, oh, the poor mother. I could not imagine holding my no, daughter. I couldn't either. Anything like that. It's we just talked so about horrendous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then for you to say that your mother actually had a near-death experience as well, that's just a whole nother level because the whole miracle child thing, I I really love this. Do you ever wonder, like you must feel a little bit special for being here if your mother nearly wasn't here because obviously if she's not here, you wouldn't be here. There's obviously yeah. a very big call on your life, Ruth. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. I, no, Ruth wouldn't have been here. It would, there would have been it, nothing that, you know, that type of thing. I mean, you think of death experiences, and we all do, I think, and and you've experienced a death experience, mm-hmm. and and it's, you know, back then nobody talked about them, and they they really didn't yeah, want to back then talk about anything that was wrong with you. They, you know, my my parents were very very quiet, and I think back then they didn't ask the doctors all the detailed questions, you know. Um, yeah. I didn't get them anyway, either that or my mother forgot about them. But my mom also had a death experience when she was my age right now. And oh, I had right. a death experience a week before she did. And so oh, when she gosh. went over, when she went over that second time, she was having, she was in the hospital and she was having intestinal surgery and they had to bring her in because it was a complication. My sister called me and warned me and she said, she said, Ruth, I, I, I don't know if mom is going to make it. And I was living way out here. I wasn't near there. And I sat, you know, I just sat and I held energy. And I never knew about shared death experiences. I had no idea anything about them. And so I just sat in meditation and I talked to her. And I said, Mom, please don't go. And, she's, and I said, we have so much to share together, you know, um, come on back. And when, when my sister went into the room, she, uh, to see her, cause she, she'd ended up, she had complete cardiac arrest. They had to bring her back the whole thing. And, uh, so she, my sister went in to see her when she got brought back into her room and she said, something happened to me. And she said, I had an angel come to me. And Marianne oh. says, what was the angel mom? Can you tell me what happened? And she said, it was Ruthie. She said, Ruthie came to me. And Ruthie told me to come back. And I and it and I blew my mind. I mean, absolutely blew my mind. Yeah. And then wow. her she came out to South Dakota where I was living and we sat and we talked about it. So um I, I didn't understand it until recently when I've heard about shared death experiences. Oh, really what man. happened. You know? That's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing. All these experiences. It seems to be within your family. So you mentioned your sister there. Yeah. Has she had a near-death experience? Has no. she had anything like this? No. My grandma Russo had one um, on my father's side. She had cardiac arrest when she was probably in her 40s. She was in a parking lot. I mean, you know, the ambulance came. They, they jump-started her and brought her back. She had complete cardiac arrest. And I remember as I was growing up, she, she would say to me, she'd say, I, I just I don't know why they brought me back. I was with Mother Mary and I was perfectly happy. I didn't want to come back and they brought me back. So if I ever die again, don't ever, don't ever (laughs) leave me. Just leave me alone. So we got told she was 94 when she died. And so 
we um it was it was really cute because my father was going to the hospital they had called her and told her that that he that she had died and i said dad can you do me a favor and he said yes and i said can you ask them if grandma smiled when she was dying and he said yeah okay i said just do it for me please so he called me right away from new britain and he said uh, he said honey he said she said she was smiling so much and she had her arms out and I said, well, then she got what she wanted. It, you know, she had a total peaceful death. She, you know, everything worked out for her. So it was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. I, I find this topic so interesting, how people are right in the final moments of life when when they don't return back, when it's not a de- near-death experience, when it's an mm-hmm. actual full-on death. Um, yes. I've heard so many beautiful, beautiful stories, some which aren't so beautiful as well. But oh, I could go down a rabbit hole with you very easily there, Ruth, to talk about all your family members, <laughs> their experiences, what the death moments were like. But I want to bring it back to your experiences. You were 16 months old when you had your first one. You're getting radiation on this growth on your spine. Yes. How does a 16 month old remember this experience? And you said it felt like you were home. Uh, I guess, yeah. The only thing I can say to you is that I don't think it ever leaves. I really don't. I think, mm-hmm. uh, you know, children are right at a, an age at that point, all right? They're right at that time where they they have that innocence. At 16 and a half years old, you have innocence. You Everything's sparkly inside of you. And, you, you know, I, I watch my grandchildren and I see that. You know, I see how they just enjoy life. All right. Mm. And and how anything's possible. There's no limitations. Mm. So I would have to say from looking at that, I would have to say that I do believe that we all have that possibility, no matter if we die or not. Mm. We can maintain that. We have a hard time, you know, being a, an ill child. Um, that's the place I went was what I felt in my heart. And that was absolute divine love when I came back. I mean, that's the only thing I can say. It, it, I guess I would describe it as a child as warmth, comfort. Yeah, it's interesting because I've heard as well that children are a lot more receptive to spiritual concepts and spiritual experiences and that we come to an age, usually around, well, from what I've heard, around about six or seven, where that kind of starts to tone down where we're not as receptive. And my thought that's going through, like the question I want to ask, but I also want to jump through your other experiences, is yeah. do you think being so much younger, you had a more profound experience? It possibly could be. You know, um, all I know is it never left. That's all I have yeah. to say. I, You know, mm-hmm. it. Um, I think being, it was... I mean, complications came. I, mean, I was in the hospital and everyone knew that there was complications with it. Um, so it's not something that I just went over and I'm telling you that, you know, it was a great experience. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it really did happen. And mm-hmm. uh, I don't know for how long. I have no idea. Um, all I know is that there was something inside of me that woke up something more in a depth that the essence of creation is within us. And that's the only way I could describe it to you now. And never, ever left. Mm. Mm, Not that everything was perfect in my life. Every time there was an obstacle, it was always a learning process. You know, that Totally, because you would have had all the physical elements of that. And like you're saying, you had medical things that you went through. You've had a couple of other experiences. Were they due to medical complications following this? Or take us through to your next experience. What happened there? Uh, The second death experience I had was when I was 20 years old. I was seven months pregnant from my son. And I went to a cardiologist's office to have electrocardiogram taken. Um, and, um, And it, you know, they just were, you know, I had heart murmur. So they were doing testing to make sure that everything would be fine and delivery and all this kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. I went in there and I was relaxed. I had many of them in KGs. I had many of them when I was growing up. So it, it didn't really, sure. it was no big thing to me. So I went in there and um, I laid down on the table. He sat, got everything set up. And after a while, I told him I was passing out. 
I was completely passing out. You know how you start losing your hearing and, and everything. I was really passing out. And I said to him, I don't feel good, and I'm passing out. And he said, Ruth, you are laying down. I said, yes, <laughs> but I am dizzy. I am really, really dizzy. And so he said, all right, I'm going to sit you up, and I'm going to let you compose yourself and get yourself back. And he said, and then we'll continue it. I said, okay. So I felt fine. I sat up and started feeling better. So he said to me, he said, I, what I would like you to do, he said, is lay back down and we'll start this again. And I said, okay. So I laid back down. Pretty soon my hearing really started. I was losing all my hearing. And um, I, I was talking to him and I said, I'm passing out. And at that point, of course, he could see the electric cardiogram had totally shut down and I had to complete cardiac arrest. And mm -hmm. he ran and got epinephrine. I had a little bit of a, a, some kind of allergic reaction to it. It didn't really help. They called the ambulance and I could hear him. I could hear him talking. I could hear him on the, you know, pushing the buttons to get the ambulance to come. The ambulance, the hospital was right across the street. And so he kept on talking to everybody and I kept on talking to him. My husband's out in the waiting room and, you know, what's going on? And he wasn't answering me. He was absolutely not answering me. So it was, um, what, what happened was with the cardiac arrest, I, because I was pregnant, I believe it was really that because I was pregnant, I didn't really leave my body. And I had two experiences going on at the same time. And I remembered the profound one of not wanting anything to go wrong with the baby. I didn't know what happened. I, you know, and he was, he was, he didn't know what happened. And mm. so um, all I can remember is that absolute divine love. And I know that I had completely gone unconscious for a while after that and um uh, or or was dead <laughs> and uh and so um i experienced that realm of existence again with absolute divine love i mean absolute power beyond anything uh, of course like again i didn't know about death experiences so um all i remember is what i remembered and before i knew it um the ambulance i guess had come I was brought over to the hospital, and when I came to, I was in the ICU. And the nurse had come in, and she said, Ruth, I'm so glad that you're okay. Because she said, when Dr. Ellingsworth came into the hospital, I've never seen him like this. And she said, his hair is white, but his face was white. And he was so upset. And, um, and so I was laying there, and... My gynecologist was like 25 minutes away from the hospital. And he, I don't know how he got there so fast, but he got there. And he came over to me and he said to me, he said, Ruth, I want you to grab a hold of my hand, son. And I said, okay. And he said, I'm going to pull you over on your side. I'm going to put pillows. He pulled pillows from every bed that was around. And he put pillows in back of me. And he said, I, he said, do not roll over. Even if President Lincoln walks here, back here from the dead, do not roll over on your back. I know what happened. The baby cut off your main artery. And he said, you're going to be okay. And he took the fetal heartbeat. The baby was fine. Nothing happened to the baby. And he said, you're going to be okay, Ruth. And he said, but there's five cardiologists in this hospital right now that they've, they've emergency called because they believe that you're not going to be okay. And he said, I have to go and sit with them, explain to them my theory on it, and they're going to explain their theories, knowing your history. And he said, I will get back to you and let you know what's happening. So I stayed and I, you know, down there in intensive care, you know, right when we first came in. And then pretty soon they rolled me up to a room and I kind of figured out I wasn't leaving. And they hooked me up to IVs and they took the fetal heartbeat again and, um, and they, they were very, very concerned. And 
my parents had come up to see me. They were out in the waiting room waiting to come in. And the priest came. Well, you know, why priests come when they come mm. to intensive care? So, or, you know, you know, this whole unit. And so he walked through the door. And, of course, you have to understand. And I really felt kind of bad for him afterwards when I thought about what I said to him because I was laying in the bed. And you have to understand, when someone comes back from a death experience, you have a tendency to be full of love, peaceful, happy, you know, everything about it. I mean, every life is beautiful. And of course, I believe the gynecologist, so I wasn't worried. Yeah. And he came into the door and he sat down and he had all the little, you know, like anointing oils and all this kind of stuff. And he says to me, he says, um, he said, Ruth, how are you? And I said, can I ask you a question? And he said, what? And I said, he, I said, are you here to give me last rites? And he says, he didn't, he couldn't say anything. I mean, he was frozen. Mm -hmm. And I said, please. I said, if you're here to give me last rites, I would really like you to leave because you're making me very nervous. And I said, I, I have going to have a baby in two months and I am not planning on dying. So the, the first one that will get called, if I have anything that I realize, or they realize that I am dead, you can come in and give me last rites, but if not, please leave. And he left. Well, my parents were out in, in the nurse's station, and they said, we don't expect her to live through the night. We've got all the preparations to take the baby. And um, and they said, um, you know, we have to take the fetal bar heartbeat of the baby every 15 minutes tonight. And my parents, of course, they didn't understand, and they're standing there, and they walked in, and they were they were pale white. I mean, they were just beside themselves. And I said, um, guys, and they said, yes. I said, have you heard the story that I'm going to die? And so they said, they said, and they just looked at me like this. And I said, I'm not going to die. I'm fine. I'm going to be okay. And so we sat and we talked and I was, you know, I was just peaceful. You know how you, yeah. when you come back from something like that, you're just so peaceful. And I could feel the baby moving and everything. I knew it was going to be all right. I, well, to make a long story short, they took every heart x-ray. They did everything they could possibly do to set, find out if Ruth was going to live. And I was in there seven days, five days on IV. And um, that first night, they rolled me over all night long, just rolled me from one side to the other because I couldn't lay on my back. And um, by the time that they would get through and get the fetal heartbeat would be the time to come back and switch me. <laughs> so it was, it was just, it was kind of... Um, whatever and then within five days they took out the rv and they started letting me eat and um two months later i had birth to a wonderful little boy and he was perfectly fine and nothing wrong with him and so that was my second death experience yeah so, wow oh, i'm so glad it worked out with the baby and everything are you okay today my health right now is better than it's been in my whole entire life I am oh, I healthier right that. now than I was throughout my whole life because I really couldn't walk. I, I was threatened to a wheelchair. Um, you know, there's just so many things. We won't get into all those right now. But, it, um, you know, I, I am healthier right now at my age of being 74 years old than I've ever been in my whole life. So oh, something gosh, worked out. So fabulous. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Some divine help there. I love that. Okay, take us to your third experience, please, Ruth. The third experience was um, um, that one just blew me away. I, I, you know, maybe having two before that, I knew that I was dying. I knew that I knew it was going to happen. I had a severe bladder infection and I was running a temp for about 104. And I got put on very high potent antibiotics. And I had had a past of being allergic to antibiotics, but this was the one that was for a severe chronic bladder infection. So I took it and, um, you know, when you take something and you know you shouldn't have, and I tried to get myself to bring it back up, but I, I knew that it was too late. It had already gone down. And so I went to bed a little while later and um, I, my head felt like it was blowing off. The head, my head was so hurt so bad and it was exploding. And I thought, oh my God. And there was some part of me that wondered if that's what was going to happen. 
And mm -hmm. I, um, I embraced my body. I had been teaching um, the heart energy and centering and focusing, you know, for so many years that I said, okay, I can do this, you know. This is a big test, but I can do this one. And so I held on to my energy, and I just said, I, in a few minutes, I'm going to feel fine. Everything's going to be okay. I'm just going to lift this all up, and it's going to go. Well, before I knew it, I was gone. I mean, I was gone. I was dead. I was gone. I was, um, and I knew it because, you know, I had had two death experiences. So I, when I went over, it was absolute divine love. It was absolute comforting beauty I don't know you could go on details of details but it, it would boil down to is it was absolutely wonderful and um there was just two there was just so much going on because there was I could feel part of me with my body I would not I would not leave it because I did not want to pass over I had two young girls my husband had left Daniel had just asked me to marry him. I, I had my whole life, you know, we had the Healing Arts Institute. I mean, I didn't want to go anywhere. And so mm -hmm. I was holding on to my body because I, you know, I wasn't in a cardiologist's office. I wasn't in a hospital. You know, what was going to happen to me? You know, that type of thing. What? So when I went over, I really got encompassed in energy. And the details that I found was that, I was being given the information about the unity of the human heart and actually the love energy. And, and it was, it was the group consciousness, which maybe you could pick out something at one time that was talking, but it was all telepathic. And I got explained that there would be some time on this earth that we would be able to bring in our consciousness to a higher level and grow you know, grow beyond what we had known so far. And I thought, okay, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's a little bit. Um, and that we have an unlimited nature of life. We, that we have, we have so much within our bodies that can restore health, that can do everything. And I, it was like a crash course. And, um, and I asked them, I said, can you tell me why when people come for healings, and it could be cancer, could be a broken bone, it could be anything, it heals as long as they want the healing. It's teaching them to heal themselves. And I said, but then, you know, a month later, it, there's something else. Why? You know, I know that our bodies might not be perfect, but why does that happen? And then I got shown a, um, that within our energy field, there's like a hardened shell. And energy goes out according to where we stand, how we feel. If we're, you know, if if we're more negative or more have worried thoughts, it closes down a little bit more because it's almost like a security blanket that some why, somewhere, somehow, we after learning how to be human beings in in here, that we formed this protective shield. And it was all, and it, um, and it depends on where we stand for the energy to flow. So, I got shown this whole thing, and I thought, okay, you know, I mean, I mean, do you really understand it completely? So, at the same time, I was sitting, getting, I mean, it was just all this information. It was just absolutely beautiful, and I, I looked at them, and I said. I, you know, I said, what are these sounds that I'm hearing? There was like music. There was like harmonics going and flowing, you know, like flowing and blending together. And it was so beautiful. And so anyway, while all of this is happening on this side, and I know that people will probably say right now, okay, lady, but it really, really did happen. There was this, this space and time that opened up. I, I can't say it looked like a video camera or a screen or something, but it was almost like something had parted and it was over here. And so they're talking to me and, and I'm absorbing this at the same time. And it is sorrow, um, unhappiness, uh, fires, um, all kinds of things. I mean, you know, conflict, 
you know, with people. And it just went on and on and on and on. And it frightened the living daylights out of me. And I put it in myself, what I would have to say, because I've been asked so many times, do you, do you have, do you remember everything that happened? I said, oh yeah. And I put it like in a little shelf to see it again. And I thought, why did I see this? Is this something that has happened in the past that, that I'm being shown or someone's prediction or I, I didn't know. And it wasn't until about maybe four months ago or two months ago, I, I don't even remember, it was so shocking to me. I was meditating and I relived this. And when I did, I realized it was oh, wow. the coronavirus. I realized it was exactly what had happened now. And at that point, Daniel and I had all our music together. We had our whole course study program done. And I now I have chills right now from this. It it was, I said, you showed me now. And I said, why? And they yeah. said, because we told you there would be a time that people would get connected enough to be able to rise their consciousness, to be able to open up that that shell, to be able to find divine love in their heart alive, not just dead, and to be able to exist with the higher presence 100% counted for. So which means the soul would start reopening, we would start expanding. And I I was blown away. And that's when we started trying to get a hold of you. <laughs> Because I, you know, wow. I, I said, okay, it's time to step out. Ruth is not someone that has gone on to have a near-death experience done before. And Daniel had seen you, and he said, look at this person. He said, I think that this would be a good, he said, I think this would be a good place. Let's try it. I said, go ahead, honey. <laughs> and oh, um, Wonderful. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it is the point where things fall into place when they're supposed to, I guess that's what I'd say. I totally believe this. I think there is a time for everything and that we can try and override that. And so, you know, I'm guilty of this. I get in there and I try and create things and make things happen because I can be very stubborn. But if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. And no matter what we do, there is a time for everything. And yes. I find what you're saying super interesting because it's, I've heard it quite a bit recently. And even um, just watching people, I mean, I'm in New Zealand where coronavirus hasn't been even anything like what you've been going through but I've seen the way that it has brought people together it's made people more aware it's made people they've been yeah. forced to stop they've been forced to pause and reevaluate pretty much everything in life so whilst it's been awful and a lot of people have lost their lives and there's been a lot of hardship and mm -hmm. you know that's going to continue for some time there is this thread that's coming through of yeah, I could, I can almost say divine appointment. There's something which is bigger yeah. than us that has got this and is trickling through. And I just see the little streams come through and I think, oh, there it is again. There it is again. So I love what you're saying. I love that you asked, why did you see this? Because that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, why would you need to see that? But maybe it is part of this bigger picture awareness opening whatever we we can't even put words to it can we so no because it frightened me uh, you know oh, I'm, I'm no uh, doubt you know, it's not something I mean I've never lived in a big city I've you know I've lived kind of in suburbs or in the country my life and I I just didn't I thought why did you why did this happen and I remember I told one person when I came back I said I saw this thing and people just looked at me you know and and when I came back of course I told them that I was told that we were all going to grow and be able to be um you know um to be expansive and 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 grow spiritually on this earth not just to go to heaven when we died or to go to wherever everybody thinks you know um I think that over the years I have opened up also what I was shown at that death experience is that every single religion, everything, people who are not religious or are religious, everybody knows love. And every mm -hmm. religious, you know, study that's out there all has that aspect. Mm -hmm. And so that that's the unification. And when we could get out of our egos and, and, um, get out of uh, the intellect showing us everything that we should do in our life 
and find that part the what I've found over the years is that the heart speaks to you. It doesn't give you long explanations, but it will give you a word, it will give you advice, it will show you a direction. And some of them are silent. And some of them are absolutely silent. And um but if we can hold that essence within our heart open, we can be available for it for it to show what needs to be shown and mm -hmm. how we can grow and all of that because it, you know it was telling everybody that I thought we could be super well I didn't say we could be superhumans but that we would have the potential to grow and to walk this earth in a higher consciousness and everybody just kind of went okay honey <laughs> but now yeah, it's happening everyone's talking about it yeah it's exactly exciting. it's happening to everyone no one is escaping this yeah <laughs> I want to go back into your experience. You were talking about they were showing me, they were telling me. Who were they? You said you communicated telepathically and it was a group. Could you see anything? Who who were they? What was going on? It, it's, I know it's a very um, spiritual experience, but in the physical, what were you experiencing? What I was experiencing was a group consciousness conversation, you know, at, at most. But one would step forward after another and there were from ever there was angels there was masters there was regular people there was everyone that was communicating it wasn't um it wasn't one religion you know i mean i was brought up catholic so you know i didn't really know much about buddhism but when i started looking into it later there was so much commonality i mean i'm talking about i'm not talking about the structured religions I'm talking about the commonality of, of whatever, but they would come forward. And of course, with me, the one that I would recognize the most would have been Mother Mary or Jesus. I mean, you know, mm. that's, mm. that's the one that I would have recognized, but it wasn't, it wasn't just them. And the thing that they kept on saying to me is that you can do as we have done. You can do this. Okay. Every human being, no matter who you are, no matter what you've ever gone through, no matter what you've ever done in past lives, no matter what, you can do this. Mm. It, and, and, you know, of course, I was like, you know, like, you know, wanted to bow, you know, and they would just say, no, you're you on the earth plane are no different than us. There is no difference between us and you and that blew me away I mean I never forgot that I mean not that I ever felt yeah. that way I mean it was like oh yeah right <laughs> you yeah. know I mean somebody, yeah, no, something like that tells you that I mean the only thing that I can say that that did was it opened my heart to such an expansion that anytime my heart I, I would I would say, everyone say, well, what, do, what does it feel like, Ruth? And I'd say, it feels like Christmas morning, you know, when you have a bunch of presents and you're all excited or something really great has happened. That's, that's what I would feel. And if I would sing, you know, do music or um, meditate or do affirmations or whatever it would bring it in, um, you know, we were shown the affinity movement. I'd do it and my whole heart would expand and I'd say, okay, God is love and love is God and the earth is wonderful, you know. Um, so my question to them, and that's when I saw the shell, I asked them, I said, you know, I've worked with a lot of people. I've experienced a lot of healings uh, with others. And I, I just said, what holds people back? And they said, it's just the soul has not completely taken on the course that it can take in life. And the protective um, shell that's around you, like if you were to see a geode, it would be like that. You know, you'd see this great big sparkly thing, mm -hmm. you know, that, the light inside of you. And then on, there's that, like a coating on the, on the outside of a geode. And that coating is like what we have. So as soon as we start um, carrying more of that divine love or carry more of that, just being appreciated of being alive. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think all of us that come back, most of us are very appreciative to still be alive, no matter if we want to come back or not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It can be very tricky coming back and um, mm -hmm. very hard to integrate 
it's the very experience. Hard. Very, very hard. But yes, we're carrying that that love piece that yeah, I can't remember your exact word that you used, but this experience, you carried it through all of your experiences. You said it's familiar, it's it's this big piece that we just have. Yeah. So and I believe that anyone can tap into that. I don't believe we need to have an experience as such. Oh, to that's the only reason that. that that I wrote the book. That's yeah, the only yeah. reason that Daniel and I have been doing this for years, putting all our work together, is because it does not, you don't, I didn't want everyone to have to die to experience because it is exactly what you said. It's hard to come back. Yeah. Yeah. People say, oh, well, you know, well, they had this wonderful experience and, and they've had this wonderful life because of it. No. Most of us have had hard times. You know, I yeah. mean, there's been obstacles and obstacles. I think so. You know, um, could I maintain that if I didn't put the effort to maintain it? No. I'd be reminded every once in a while, you know. Yeah. I probably wouldn't be alive now, to tell you the truth. But um, that was our passion was to share it with people who have had death experiences and how they can really open or open to their own, you know, whatever their purpose is now on earth. Mm. Or for those who have not, that they don't have to have one. Mm. You know, you can exactly. still we don't. all the same. It's not... It's not any different. I just get more excited, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and I can hear that in your voice, which is a beautiful thing. Ruth, when you were having this experience with the beings and you started to ask your question, were you aware that you were dead or were you said at one point you're still connected to your Oh, no, body? I knew I was dead. I knew I had cardiac arrest. Um, I, I definitely knew it. There was some part of me with my body, and now I understand um, – death experience sharing someone coming and helping you when someone is dying which i did not understand that um i had three people with me i had my husband and i had two friends two people that i knew that were at my bed and i and i knew i wasn't alone down there and when i got told they said you are going back and i said what is my poor heart going to do you know mm. and um they said, you will be all right. Stay in the centered space, um, focus, and uh, take your time coming back. And so when I woke up, I woke, I, Daniel looked at me and I said, um, I think I died. And of course, I really didn't know about death experiences. And I said, but I was over there. So he kind of, um, he nurtured me. And at that point is when I really started breathing. And if I put my hand on my heart and I, I'm, I should have went to a doctor, but you have to understand after years and years and years being in doctor's offices and oh, I just, I, there was no way that I was, and what were they going to say? No lady, you didn't die. And so I thought, no, there's no way that I'm going to show this with anyone. And so, but there were times that if you put your hand in front of my heart, you could feel my heart. Boom, boom like that oh, really? after I had come back. And so I knew that I had to um, take it easy. I knew I had to be careful. Um, yeah. I remember sitting out in the yard, um, just asking for help, saying my head hurts. I don't feel good. I need some help. And um, at that point, you know, I heard what I heard over there, just lift up what you don't need, my dear. You know, just a couple little words. And so I just started, you know, doing meditations and just started doing everything that I do. After my second second death experience, all I do is re every time I had a hard time, I would just recite the word, one word of love. And I would say it over and over and over and over. And everything around me would change. And, uh, and mostly it was within me, but other people who were in tune would just relax and everything was beautiful and um and so that was part of my recovery after my second mm. one and i maintained that with the third one you mm, know i was, really like that yeah and because that's something that all of us can do i do that when i'm really mm. upset about something or i'm hurting over something i try and think about all the good things in my life and yes that i might feel awful and rock bottom and just yeah. want to lie on the bed and cry but actually look at all the good things and i love that you can do that as well focus on love and just reciting love, that's something we can all do. And it's so simple. 
It's, it uh-huh. is so simple and it works. That's, that's mm. the beauty about it. And it will open the human heart. Mm. It will bring warmth. So what I would explain it now with the heart is, is warmth, mm. peace, you know, mm. love, just everything will be okay. And I'm not saying that I don't have trying times, you know. Oh. Totally, totally. Isn't anybody yeah. still listening? <laughs> yeah. No, none of us can say that. And me as well, like I screw up over and over again. Things are hard. You know, we make things hard, but also we have challenges. And it comes back to I think that we they're there for learning experiences. They're there so that we can progress. And like you're talking about the shell, it's so we can expand and mm-hmm. hold more of the goodness in, I suppose. So following having three experiences in your life, Mm -hmm. are you concerned that there might be a fourth? And no, no, outright no. No, I, I, um, oh, of course there always could be. I mean, I'm not going to say there couldn't be. I didn't, I didn't really even think I had three. So, um, I think that a lot of us, even if people who have one or don't have any, we do have experiences. They might not be full on death experiences or cardiac arrest, but they're, they're experiences that you never change. You, you're never the same. Mm. So do I worry about it? Absolutely not. If, if it's my time, it's my time. You know, mm. Um, mm. I'm very comfortable with, with, with leaving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally, totally understand that. And that's a really beautiful thing. What about the sense of purpose? Do you, do you question, what am I here for? Why have I come back three times? What am I meant to do? Or was that vision that you had, which turned out to be what we're going through now with the pandemic and things like that, do you feel that you're really aligned with your purpose or are you still trying to work out why all this keeps happening? No, I don't, I don't have why it's all happening. I do have to say that I think once our souls start opening, we start really seeing um, I have to say that I, I'm i a self-published person because I don't want anything changed in there. I don't want the wording changed because it flows. Mm-hmm. And so I, the two books that we've done have been self-publishing. And that's difficult, you know, because self-publishers don't get recognized that much. Um, but with something like this, there's nothing I could do with it, I, you know, most of the information was given forth and I'm not going to change the words and they work. So, Mm. but, um, so I guess what you're asking me is up until, um, my third death experience, I really wondered why I was here. I really did. I had a rough marriage. I had, um, four children, you know, it just, it was, um, it was difficult. And, uh, and I wondered what my purpose was. But to tell you the truth, some of our purposes sometimes in life are, they seem to us very minor, but they're very Mm. powerful. Mm. You know, so, so now coming into where Daniel and I are at the age that we are, I am very much very happy with, um, with what we've done, you know, and that we can share it with other people. Um, It's, I don't think, I think I did feel lost in this world. It was very hard for me to come back. Um, But then there were so many grandeurs that I, so ask your question again, maybe I can answer it better. Oh, to be honest, I think it's gone. I don't, I don't hold on to everything too well, Mm -hmm. but I want, I want to ask you one big question, Ruth. Yes. What is the one thing, somebody listening to this, what is the one thing that you want to leave with them? What is the one key message from your experiences, from life? What's the one thing that you would hope that they would get out of our conversation today? That they're unlimited. That there's nothing holding us back. Absolutely, positively nothing. I have had so many challenges in my life, fires, our house burning, um, and holding up my centeredness, that was the scariest, one of the most scariest things that ever happened in my life. We had, um, Daniel and I had just been married and, and we had moved to Wyoming and we had an old house we were living in, you know, old ranch, and um, it had a wood burning stove in it. And the stove was leaning onto the wood and we didn't know it, the, you know, the structure of the house. Mm. And I woke up in the middle of the night, Daniel was working, and I woke up to smoke. 
and it was um I could it was like insulation burning and we had just gone to sleep the girls and I and they were in their room and I'm laying there and I'm thinking, what is the smell I can't imagine what is the smell and um there's a point that I'm going to make after this was all over and I I woke up the girls and we opened up of course not very smart opened up the closet door that where the chimney went up and of course the smoke just barreled out and I called 911 and they said get out of the house and we grabbed the animals and we got out of the house the dogs and the cat and um and I was just standing there and the and the in the and the woman who I was talking to with dispatch we were 35 minutes away from where the how the truck had come out and and she said to me she said you have to get away from the house I said it is really cold very very windy in Wyoming at that time and I said and she said but you have brickets coming out of your chimney and I said it's more than my chimney it's out of the roof and so she said get away from the building and so I stood in the garage and I yelled at God and I said we have no insurance we have no way to do anything I do not know what to do in my life I don't know I it, what are we going to do I said I've never asked you for anything and I am now. And my my daughters went quite a ways away to the nearest neighbor. We lived out on ranch land. We we're renting this place. And I sat in the cruiser's car and I didn't realize that the cruiser was locked and I couldn't get out. And, you know, I had my son came and there was people that knew us that knew there was a fire going on. One person told another and they're all lined up and they couldn't come onto the property. And I sat there and all I did was I held exactly what what I would tell others at a time like this. Okay, and this is why I'm bringing it up. I held that centered spot. And of course, the tears were streaming because I, you know, I didn't know what we were going to do. We had no money. Um, my ex-husband had left me and we were trying to get our feet on the ground. And I um, and I just I just sat there and I went into that centered spot. I went in and anyone can do this. All right. It's it's just breathing into your heart, allowing yourself to come one with that essence and following your breath. I mean, I use sound a lot because I've had sound open to me after my third death experience. But it was it was either sound or it was breath work where if you breathe enough in, into your heart and you just calm yourself down and you focus you can actually stand like you've experienced with your death experience. You can, you can stand in that essence that's expansive. And I held that, it had to have been for half an hour. I just focused on that one spot. And so after this was all over, we went and, and slept at a friend's house. And, um, and we got our girls that were up at a neighbor's house. And we came back the next day to look through the house. And we walked in, and I had a white couch. And the white couch was white. And I'm standing there going, whoa. Wow. So we walked through, you know, the, the girls and Daniel and I walked through the house. And I, and I looked at everything, and nothing got burned of our belongings. Nothing got damaged. Wow. It had smoke damage, you know. So we walked around to the kitchen, and there was the whole roof was burned, you know, on that side of the house, you know, right? I mean, here's the living room and here's the kitchen. And so we walked, we walked into the kitchen and I just burst out crying because I said to the girls, go in your room and see if anything's burned because the bathroom that was Jason's, Jason to the bedroom of where they were sleeping, nothing was damaged. Mm -hmm. There was a dresser in the hallway and it did not burn. And the only thing, and, I, and I'm not promoting, you know, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph or anything, but someone a long time, I had had it my whole life. It was in my family. Someone had given me a carved statue of Mother Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. And Mother Mary was holding Jesus. And on the wall, there was this, um, there was this area that was all burned and right around this picture, this wooden plaque. And the wall was gone underneath it. It was being held by the side. And I took off the statue, you know, this little wooden plaque, and nothing was burned. It had a little soot on the top. 
Oh, and I yeah. went, oh, my goodness. So just then the insurance guy came in and he said, there's nothing wrong with this house. And we said, walk around the corner. And they they put ozonizer, ozonizer is in there. And before you knew it, all the odor was gone. And and But I learned that centeredness. And I guess that's what I would say to people, mm -hmm. to trust in your own essence and know that you will be taken care of. If the house burned down to the ground, something else would have opened up. And you know that and I know that. Our lives move forward. But just the fact that I was shown that nothing was damaged, and that was, you know, my quest was to teach other people, you know, how to, um, how to recognize, you know, the positive and negative currents. Because I knew when I was sitting in the cruiser, if I was out with them, we would have been just, we would have been talking about how devastational it was going to be, what was going to happen. You know, we didn't have any money. We would have been talking about everything. And because I wasn't out with that, it, it, you know, I really think that I connected to some energy that helped bring that up, you know, bring mm -hmm. all that together. Mm -hmm. So was I very religious growing, you know, in my marriage? No, no. But after you have some death experiences, you're kind of, you know, you kind of know what's going on, don't you? I don't know. Oh, uh, do we? I, I don't know. I mean, well, there's something going on, trust me. But, yeah, I don't know. I find it, yeah, interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Sorry, I'm just totally. It's good. We only limit ourselves, don't we? We are our biggest limitation. Yeah. So I really love what you've said there. Ruth Russo Clothier, thank you so much. So many stories. We could go down so many avenues of this. I really mm -hmm. love that you've shared your experiences with us. I love how they're all very unique, how they're all very different as well. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate your stories. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to stay updated with all of the events we have going on and to visit www.letstalknearedeath.com to join the VIP community.